we take it from here. All right, thank you, Rachel. Um, Rachel is my right arm, um, as I am not great with technology. And so while I love to share ideas and have discussions with folks on parenting topics, um, I'm gonna rely on her heavily with this technology piece. And I just ask for your grace as we figure out how to work the webinar, um, because this is the first time that we're actually doing this. So thank you for your patience. I appreciate that. Um, for anyone who I haven't met before, I know that a lot of you have attended Love and Logic classes in the past, uh, but I just wanted to introduce myself. Um, my name's obviously Carrie Gray. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I've been teaching parenting classes for 25, no, 21 years now, and working as a marriage and family therapist for 26 years. And so I'm old, as my kids will say. Um, probably my most important credential is that I'm also a parent myself. And so um, the things that I teach parents are also things that I do within my own household. And so as we get into our program tonight, I'm gonna to introduce you to my family and also share, um, you know, just examples of things that have gone well, not have gone well, so that you can use my mistakes, if you will, as an opportunity to learn and prevent those same mistakes in your own home. And so I appreciate you being here tonight. And let's go ahead and get started. Um, the topic, you know, uh, the reason why, first of all, that we decided to provide these webinars is just like anyone else. Um, we had planned a Love and Logic class to take place in April, and because of the social distancing and stay-at-home orders, obviously we couldn't do that. And so I got together with Rachel and we started to talk about, well, what can we do to still help out families in our community? And so we decided that we would give this a try, basically to reach out to folks who have either been involved in Love and Logic previously or just any parent who would like to join in on this discussion and see if we could reach you to provide some support um, as well as some different ideas for how we can use the stay at home order as an opportunity to develop important life skills in our kids. And so that's where the idea came from. And so I know that we're probably getting a little tired about and we know that we need to not spend a tremendous amount of time on media because of all the stress that that creates. We need to put some limitations on that. And so, but I also want to recognize um, that obviously this is a very stressful time. Um, we all have a lot of anxieties and a lot of uncertainties that we're dealing with. Uh, many of us have been thrust into roles where uh, you know, our kids are home now, and so we're, we're having to be an educator, which most of us don't have a degree as an educator or a teacher, as well as just dealing with adapting to having everyone at home. We might be working from home, but then in addition to that, we also have the responsibilities of running our home. So here's an opportunity I choose to look at things as an opportunity once I get over being overwhelmed, which believe me, I've, I, I've been there and I go there at certain times during the day. But the silver lining in, in this um, that I can think of is that oftentimes when I um, meet up with friends who are also parents or who are attending parenting classes, I'll say, how are you doing? And the, the common response is busy. All right, um, we have traditionally lived in a society where we're essentially on the go. We are literally running from one thing to the other thing. And now because of the stay at home orders, we have an opportunity to spend a lot more time with our family. And let's look at, okay, so we don't have control over this situation. So what can we do to maximize the situation that we're in. And so that is our silver lining is how can we use the stay at home order and extra time with our families to help teach our kids important life skills that will help them in years to come. 
And so today or tonight, our workshop content is going to uh, focus in these areas. Um, we're basically going to talk about how to use this time to Im teach important life skills that will strengthen actually our family through a sense of belonging while also helping our kids to, to build self-confidence, which we all know that we want to have confidence kids. Now, when you look at this, it says the importance of family contributions. Um, what, what do you suppose contributions is code for? And you can certainly uh, type that into your chat box if you would like. And so if you go up to the top of your screen and click on that, uh, the chat, you can basically enter what you think uh, that means as far as family contributions. We'll see if we can get, that was my husband sneezing in the background. Sorry, folks. Um, and essentially, um, when we talk about family contributions, we're really talking about chores or ways in which our kids can contribute uh, to the family and getting things done around the house. Um, we use the word contributions because oftentimes when we think about chores, that has a negative con connotation. And so tonight we're going to be addressing the importance of having our kids involved in those activities, but also how to increase their engagement, meaning getting them to want to do it, but also decrease the resistance that most kids are going to put out when you ask them to help out. And finally, we're going to talk about when we're dealing with kids who simply are just not wanting. Okay, this is one of those moments. Hey, Phil, turn off our dog. Sorry, folks. Um, so this is one of those moments where grace is needed. Um, but so how to deal with a kid who's literally defiant, you know, who basically says, I'm not going to do this and you can't make me do it. Um, we're going to go that into that rabbit hole as well, and um, we're going to try to open this up for questions as we go through this workshop. So if you need some clarification on anything that I'm sharing with you, um, please go ahead and post that, and Rachel's going to work to try to bring that to my attention. Um, if it's not covered in the workshop, we'll definitely, we're going to take some time at the end of the workshop uh, to specifically look at your questions. So. Oh, no. <laughs> there we go. So moving on, um, one of the opportunities that I wanted to make sure that you all are aware of is that the Love and Logic Institute, for a very brief period of time, is offering their uh, Parenting with Love and Logic, Parenting the Love and Logic Way program for free. And so even though I've been teaching this for 21 years, I'm going to log on and I'm going to participate in that class because what I find is that even when we have people come back and teach the class, oftentimes you're going to hear things differently than you did the first time. And so part of the reason why I taught, have been teaching this class for so long is because love and logic, while it's not a rocket science approach to parenting, it is something that doesn't really come natural, meaning, you know, responding to kids' poor choices with empathy rather than anger and frustration is not a typical parent response. And so I, I wanted to bring this to your attention so that if you would like to take advantage of that opportunity that you can certainly log on uh, to their website and sign up for it. So here is our first poll. Uh, the first thing I want to do is just check in with everyone to see how we're doing. Um, earlier, I talked a little bit about how uh, our role has changed, our world has changed. And so we want to keep things real in this workshop, and your identity is going to be pro uh, protected here. So if you would take a minute to go ahead and complete our poll. Um, are you someone who is still in bed, the family can fend without me or for themselves? Are you just taking things one day at a time? Or are you kind of feeling like, hey, I got this, I, I could run this webinar. And if that's the case, we're going to reach out to you uh, at a, a later time to help out. And so if everyone could take a minute to go ahead and submit your responses. 
And depending on the number of people who are on, uh, you know, Zoom, Zoom programs and calls at this time, it might take a few minutes for it to appear. A hundred percent of us say, let's take it one day at a time. And I think that's a very good management, stress management approach to dealing with uncertainties is to take things one day at a time. Uh, we can learn from today and tomorrow is definitely another day. So let's go ahead and let's move forward. Okay, so a little bit about my family. I mentioned that I am a parent and that's probably my best prerequisite for teaching this webinar. And so I wanted you to meet them because I'll be sharing stories about them this evening. If you look at our bookends here, um, you're going to notice that I am, uh, I'm on the left as you look at your screen and my husband Phil is on the right. Um, we have four lovely girls. Some of you are probably moaning and feeling empathetic for me because girls can be a lot of work, um, as can boys. Um, but this is my oldest daughter, Allison, who is 25 years old, and she has already moved out of the house and is a self-sustaining independent adult, which is awesome. And then I have my daughter, Jennifer, here, who just graduated from college, and she is also just uh, gotten a job and is working through graduate school. And then Team Gray is, uh, for right now, going to be Katie Gray, who is right here. Um, she's in college, but she's uh, very excited to come home. Not really. And then we have my daughter, uh, Samantha, who you can see right here up front and center, who is 14 years old. Now, uh, just to keep things real, I uh, apologize to this girl, Allison, frequently. She is the oldest child, so I refer to her as, I'm, I'm trying to figure this out. I love you. I'm doing the best I can. Uh, over the years, we're starting to figure things out, but if you're like me and have more than one child, you already know that their personalities are different and what works with one kid may not work as effectively with your other kids. Um, as far as my other children, and I bring these up because they might somehow open up the door. Um, this is, these are the replacement children. So as children move out, I essentially replace them with a fur child. Gus replaced Allison, Charlie replaced Jennifer, and this lovely little girl down here below is Lucy who uh, replaced Katie, and these pictures really do a nice job of capturing their personalities. <laughs> My daughter, uh, Sammy, is in the next room saying, what? Okay, so here's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, the benefits of having your kids contribute around the house. Um, one of the biggest benefits that we can see in the literature and research, um, especially if we even go back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, is that people long for a feeling of belongingness. They want to be a part of the team. And so by providing kids with opportunities to contribute to running the household, they can then start to view themselves as a valued member of the family team. If they're not able to fulfill their duty, you know, maybe they're ill or, or whatnot, we're going to miss them. You know, we really need them and we rely on each other to make things work as a family. A second piece of this is that learning and mastering new skills ultimately increases your child's self confidence. Um, think about your life. And, you know, certainly we could co look at COVID-19, but we're right in the midst of that. And so that's a hard one to decipher at this moment. But typically, when we look back through our life and some of the challenges that we've encountered, we typically learn the most in situations where we've really had to dedicate ourselves, we had to persevere, we had to problem solve, um, we had to just keep going in order to get the job done or to learn a new skill. And so another reason why it's really helpful to have our kids contribute is because ultimately it will help to increase their self-confidence. 
And we know that kids who have high levels of self-confidence are also happier kids. In addition to that, we see something that we call the transfer effect. And so as I'm able to accomplish things as simple as helping out around the house, it will help me to solve problems in terms of the schoolwork, you know, some of the challenges that I have to encounter there, whether it's, you know, with teachers or just um, working through a subject that doesn't come as easily to me, as well as dealing with people, you know, just in life, you know, learning how to deal with difficult people. Um, this is something that's an ongoing process that requires a lot of um, practice and time in order for us to get good at it. Another piece that is really important is that we're finding that kids who make daily contributions are less entitled and ultimately more fun to be around, all right? Um, one of the things that we have to be careful of as we speak about the generations behind us, if you will, is that there's a tendency to downplay the work ethic of the, the next generation. We might say things like, you know, when I was a kid, I, and we fill in the blank. And when we look at kids these days, oftentimes we say, things like negative connotations, like they're lazy, they don't know how to work hard, which the reality is most of the kids these days, just like in years past, are very hard workers. Um, they have high levels of commitment and they have a lot of wonderful qualities going for them. So I want you to keep in mind that we are the ones who created the generation behind us so ultimately, they are a reflection of us. That can be a little hard to swallow, but the ultimate, that is the ultimate truth. Our kids are a reflection of us and the world around them that we created for them. And so how can we help them to be less entitled? entitled? Um, you know, it's very easy to get caught up in the busy culture of wanting our kids to be involved in so many things. And because of that, we have a tendency to make the mistake of doing so much more for them instead of letting them become more independent and doing more things for themselves, but also for others, including the family. And so it's important to strike that healthy balance. The last thing um, you know, that we're gonna look at is that essentially when we teach kids how to run a household, ultimately, when they leave the nest, um, they're better prepared for life. I remember I have three kids now that two of them have finished college, one of them is a junior in college. And I'm not saying this as a, a bragger type of thing, but um, for my own sanity and because I totally believed in the love and logic philosophy of engaging kids in contributions, my own kids had a lot of opportunities to learn how to do things like laundry, meal preparation, um, cleaning, things like that before they left our house. And I remember getting a phone call from my oldest daughter, Allison, saying, wow, I'm really surprised at what some of, some of the kids, some of my roommates are not able to do. And and it didn't come from a place of being judgmental, but rather it was more of a place of thank you. You know, I don't have the stress because these things we practice for in our own home. All right. Um, and so that's another uh, ingredient in terms of why it's important to let our kids contribute and to take the initiative in doing that. How do we get them co to contribute? This is a challenging part. This actually would have been a good place for a poll, but we'll look at that in uh, next time around. I, I imagine many of you growing up actually had the opportunity to make contributions. I know that uh, I myself, you know, my parents, my mother in particular, would make a list of things uh, that my brother and I could do in order to contribute to the household. Um, frankly, at the time, I felt like the list was a little excessive, um, but needless to say, 
by having to contribute, we did learn some really important skills. I'm gonna go a little bit deeper into each of these things listed here on the slide, but just to give you a brief overview, a way to get things started would be to create a list of things that need to be done in order to run the house. Um, you know, right now we're trying to do so many things from home and we're probably all feeling a little bit overwhelmed and we need a little bit of relief. We need a little bit of help. Um, a story that I like to share with folks is a story of a mom who, when I first started as a marriage and family therapist, um, I'm just going to call her Brenda. Brenda came in for a counseling appointment. And the only thing I knew about Brenda at the time was that she was feeling depressed. And so when a person comes to meet with me for the first time, we spend, you know, we spend some time getting to know a little bit about their family, their daily life and things along those lines. And Brenda shared that she was the mother of five kids. They were all 14 and under. All right. So we're already empathizing with Brenda. She's got her, you know, there's a lot going on there. Um, she's married, but her husband travels a lot. And so there wasn't that resource and support there. Um, she, I asked her, what is your typical day like? And she would say, well, you know, on a normal day when the kids are in school, I essentially spend about an hour waking the kids up, getting them out of bed and getting them out the door. From there, oftentimes I'll get calls from the school saying, hey, mom, I forgot X, Y, and Z. Will you please bring it to me? And, and so, of course, I'm frustrated about that, but I know that these things are important, so I'll go and I'll bring these things to my children. Some of you are probably pausing and as you're listening and shaking your head and going, ooh, this is not a good idea. Um, which let's be let's be fair it's it, it's easier to be objective when it's not your kid right <laughs> and so um essentially what was happening is this mom really hated being a mom and that was be partly because she was taking on a lot of ownership for responsibilities that really needed to be shared amongst the family and this was causing her to feel depressed and her kids to develop the habit of just knowing, well, I can rely on mom. I don't have to be responsible. Mom is going to go ahead and take things for me. She's going to take care of it if I make a mistake. And so when we look at this in the context of having kids help out around the house, you know, we can look beyond that in terms of just taking care of things in their everyday lives. But as we set kids for up for success in terms of chores, the first thing we're going to do is create a list of things that need to be done in order to run the household. Then we know that people generally, generally like to have feelings of control over their lives. Um, no one likes it when a spouse or if their boss were to say, do it, do it now. Um, the natural response to that is going to create create resistance, all right? Even if you're somebody who is relatively compliant, we like to have a sense of control over our lives. And so the next two pieces is how we do that. Um, let our kids choose from the list. Provide them with a time frame for getting the chore done. Um, we're not gonna say, hey, do it now or do it this particular way. We're gonna say, when would be a reasonable time for you to have this done? And obviously, the younger the child, the, the tighter the parameters that we're going to do, we're going to put on that. Another thing that's important to reflect on is teaching them how to do the job. Um, I've worked with many parents who have said to their kids, especially younger kids, all right, I'm going to go make dinner. Um, you guys have created a tremendous mess in this toy room. Clean it up. So the natural response that's going to happen with a three, four, or five-year-old is they might start picking things up for a period of time, and then they're naturally going to get distracted, and they're not going to do what they're going to, you know, what you've asked them to do. And so that's going to create some anger and frustration on your part. So it's really important to show them how to do the job and not make assumptions that they already know how to do it. 
Now the tricky part is that on the job training, we wanna make it fun. Um, my husband, Phil, uh, when our kids were little, he was really good about making it fun. Uh, and one of the main jobs with little kids is to pick up their toys. And so he would turn that into a competition where the kids were literally shooting Legos into the Lego box, Barbies into the toy box. It was a good time. And so they started to associate picking up with fun because dad was making it fun and it was also a relationship thing. So it didn't, it didn't become a, a punishment thing or something that they had to do. Now, the next thing is having realistic expectations, all right? Um, one of the things that I've noticed that parents do, and I have to be careful of myself, is once I learn that, hey, it's really good for your kids to contribute, um, given how busy life is, it's very tempting to create a list of everything that needs to be done and go and delegate it to your kids. That's not the intention here. Um, we don't want to delegate all of our re adult responsibilities or chores to our kids. Obviously, the younger the kid, um, the less amount of time that they're going to spend on the chores, and that time can grow certainly as they get older. Another piece has to do with the quality of the chore. I'm, if I were to do a poll right now, my poll would be to ask you how many of you would consider yourself to be perfectionists, all right? And a lot of us are perfectionists. I can be a perfectionist myself. And I like to reframe that to tell folks that, you know, they're just really passionate about things, right? And so when we look at having our kids contribute, something to keep in mind is that if you want the job done perfectly, which by the way, is there any really such thing as perfect? No. But if you want a job done perfectly, that's a job that you should do yourself and delegate a different job to your child, all right? Um, we want them to want to participate and we realize that um, it takes time to get good at doing things. And so perfection needs to go out the window. Uh, another piece that also can be applied in other areas of your kid's life is to focus on what they do right. I remember when Jennifer, who is now 22 years old, uh, was four years old, one of the things that we practiced was making, making the bed. And so many times I would come in or my husband Phil would come in and we'd work with the kids on making, making the bed fun and showing them how to do it. And there was this one morning where I still remember Jennifer coming to our room and saying, mom, come see, you've got to see this. And I'm like, oh boy, you know, mixed feelings about what am, what am I going to come and see? Um, but I'm like, all right, here we go. And so I went to her room and she said, what do you think? And I looked and sure enough, after a whole week of practice, Jennifer had made her bed and I chose to focus on the fact that the bed spread was pulled tight, the pillows were basically in the right place, and I chose to not focus on the fact that there was a huge lump in the middle of the bed, which was probably the sheet or a stuffed animal or something like that. The reality is when we choose to focus on the things that our kids do well, it's empowering. If I were to say to her, yeah, you know, nice job, but, and to focus on what she did wrong, that's going to lower her motivation for wanting to do it in the future. Um, same rule applies with school. You know, when we focus mostly on what our kids do right, they're glad to bring, uh, you know, bring papers and different things to us. Whereas when we focus on their weaknesses and what they're not doing right, there's a tendency for them to want to hide those things. Um, but there is a balance here. Um, uh, uh, another poll to ask you, and you can raise your hand from where you are. Um, how many of you have kids that might cut corners when given the opportunity to do chores? Go ahead and raise your hand. 
Um, we certainly experienced this in our home. Uh, you know, when our kids were younger, we lived in a cul-de-sac and in our home, we would uh, do quite a few chores on Saturdays. And I recall one particular morning when we woke up, it was a spring day, everyone is outside. And so of course the kids wanted to get outside and be with their friends. And Allison's job was to clean her bathroom that morning. And so I said, hey, Allison, all right, Love and Logic parents, this is an enforceable statement coming. You're welcome to go outside and play with your friends as soon as you have that bathroom cleaned. And she knew how to clean the bathroom. She's 13 years old, right? Two minutes later, uh, she runs outside and I'm thinking, huh, you know, she, this kid has probably not done a great job, you know, in dealing with this situation. And so sure enough, I go upstairs and she really hasn't done a good job. And so instead of humiliating her in front of our friends, because remember love and logic relationship is our primary concern. I said to her, I said, Allison, come here. And I did one of these and she came over and I said, come here, I need to show you something. And she's like, what? I'm playing with my friends. And I said, it'll only take a few minutes. And so I took her by, by the shoulders gently, put my hand around her, we walked upstairs and I said, what do you see as I, she was standing in the doorway to the bathroom and she goes, but mom, none of the other kids have to do chores. And I said, I love you too much to argue. You're welcome to head out with your friends as soon as this job is done right. All right, so a little love and logic review there. She was frustrated, but then she took time to actually do the job in the way that it was intended to be done. Um, so moving on, so how do we set this up in our household? Um, part of it has to do with the attitude in which we approach involving our kids uh, in these contributions. And here's the attitude. We help each other because we love and need each other. Um, how good does it feel or would it feel um, when you're struggling or feeling overwhelmed? Maybe it's a busy time at work um, for your kids to come up to you and say, hey, how can I help? What can I do to help out? Um, we all love to have that kind of support, even if we are reluctant to ask for it. And so our attitude is going to set the tone around these chores. Um, one of the things that Love and Logic recommends, so this is their idea, is to, as we said on the first, uh, previous slide, is to create a list of the things that need to be done in order to run the house. Now, if you look at the slide on the left side, you're going to see the adult contributions. And this is more helpful with kids who are a little bit older in age, you know, maybe kindergarten on up, they're going to get this a little bit more. Preschoolers not going to get this, all right? And so we can take some time to list the things that we do as adults to help out around the house. Meaning I have a job, so I'm earning money. I'm going to provide you with food. I'm going to pay for the rent or our house payment. Um, you probably are going to have other needs that I'm going to need to take care of. I certainly am going to drive you many places, and at least until you have a license, but then I still might be driving you places. Um, when you're really young, I'm going to be taking care of your laundry, uh, taking care of yard work and cleaning the house, right? Now, this isn't intentional, but by providing our kids with this, ultimately they're going to start feeling like, wow, you know, uh, mom and dad really do quite a bit you know, around the house, and they might even feel a little bit guilty about, mm, maybe I could be doing a little bit more. You know, what, what can I do to contribute? Um, and so where we wanna start with that, with our how can you help on the right side, is to start by considering the age of the child. And so we're gonna go ahead and I'm, we're gonna take a minute to tune in to our next poll. Um, Rachel's going to set this up so that you can mark all that apply. It says, what are the, what age range are your kids? 
And so if you would go ahead and do that now, this will help us with our planning. And I went ahead and submitted my answer. So uh, hopefully you have all had an opportunity to do the same. And pretty soon we should see, um, you know, kind of a summary come up here about, you know, where we are in terms of our kids and our, the ages of our kids. While we wait for that to happen, I'm gonna go ahead, oh, here it is. Oh, wow, great. So we have great representation here. So we've got some little kids, preschool to second grade, 41% are third through sixth grade, lot of parents of middle school and high school students. And I'm loving the disgruntled college student. I can totally relate to that. Um, so let's look at what makes sense. Um, these are just some ideas and certainly, um, you can certainly add to these, but obviously we're looking at the age of the kid and what is developmentally appropriate. And so these are ideas that actually I didn't come up with on my own, but have been given to me by previous Love and Logic participants. Um, so if you are a parent with a preschool through a third grader, um, you know, daily living things like making your bed, you know, can they help in sorting the laundry, you know, uh, darks and, and whites? Could they, when you're out in the yard, help by picking up sticks in the yard? Um, certainly a big way for them to help out is just to picking up after themselves with toys. Uh, and then you can see some other examples here. Now, the question I need to ask you is our preschoolers really good at helping with chores? Yes, no, not so much. But we recognize that and we want to, um, you know, encourage them to participate. And so we need to be, again, this goes back to the expectations. They're not going to be all that helpful, all right? It's actually more work. Uh, when working with a preschooler, but the investment that you're making in doing this now is something that's going to pay off into the future. And so again, with our younger kids, oftentimes we're doing the chore with them, you know, up through maybe kindergarten. All right, we're making it fun. We're breaking down the task. We're giving the kid a high five. Then as they get older, uh, we kind of step out of that process and empower them to start taking on some of those roles on their own and giving them high fives as they finish. So I'm not going to go through all of these, but here's what I want you to be thinking about. Think about when your kid graduates from high school. You know, what do you want them to be able to do independently? And how can you use this time while they're in your home to have them learn those skills? And so you're gonna see obviously as we progress through age that the responsibilities are gonna include obviously the things that the younger kids are doing, but they're gonna grow as the kid gets older. Now, I noticed that um, quite a few of you, I think it was 41% of you have a college kid. And that is a remarkable ch challenge right now um, because these kids, uh, if they have been away at school, they're very used to, to being independent. And so there's going to be an adjustment as they come back into the home and realize that they still need to be a contributor to the house. Um, but, you know, we're going to set the tone for that and we're going to have them help come up with ways in which they're going to contribute and help come up with timelines for that. Uh, and so here are some ideas. So, you know, thinking about your own kids, it says, how can your kids help? And then what Id additional ideas do you have? And so as you look at this list, if you would... Uh, take a minute if you have some additional ideas on things that your kids are doing or could be doing. If you want to put those in the chat box for everyone to see, um, that's something that we can then share. 
<laughs> I hear someone else's dog barking in the background. Can you hear me? This is Cheryl. Yeah, Cheryl, go ahead and talk. Well, I am, I can't see your chart. Oh no. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm kind of lost. So what do I need to do? Okay, so Rachel, I'm gonna put Rachel on so she can tell you. Okay. Okay, Sher Cheryl, I will um, get in touch with you. Can you see the chat box? The chat box. Yes. Okay, I'll chat with you in the chat box and get you figured out. Now, you mean? Yes, or, yep. Okay. Just give me one minute. I'm gonna remute you so Carrie can get started and I'll work with you on the screen. Okay. Oh my goodness, I'm loving this. Um, so I'm seeing, okay, teamwork, collaboration, love it, Shane. Uh, cooking, huge. You know, especially if any of you have picky eaters. I mean, talk about a great way to break that habit. Uh, having kids help to plan the meals, uh, depending on their age. Uh, obviously, there's different levels of involvement that you can be in that. Um, taking out the trash, love it. Vacuuming. The cool thing is the kids are going to think that this is fun. I love this. My son loves helping scrub the toilets. Wow, that's pretty exceptional right there. Keep cheering him on with a lot of hot <laughs> high fives. Um, the cat litter, so certainly helping out with pets is a huge one, uh, whether it's you know give, giving them fresh water, feeding them, uh, cleaning the cat litter box is, is a, you know obviously another good one. I like this ladybug uh, talks about recycling, you know, teaching kids about the environment and how they can contribute to that. Uh, my daughter loves to clean the windows. I think this is awesome. And so uh, there's many things that it sounds like many of you parents are already doing um, that help your kids to learn these different skills. And so this is, this is awesome. And so as you look at the chart that I have up here, these are just ideas to get, uh, you know, to get you started, if you will, and you have the best creativity, you know your kids, you know what needs to be done, um, just go with it. So awesome. Um, so moving on, so oftentimes it's helpful, and I, I want you to pay attention to the wording on this. It says, how will your child keep track of contributions, all right? And so we want to empower them to own this. That's a big piece of love and logic is that ownership of responsibility. And so these are some different things that I found online. You know, certainly if you get on Pinterest or you can create your own um, chore list or however you want to do this, uh, just having a way to help them remember what it is that they're going to do once you decide what are their chores. For little kids, visual reminders tend to work really well. Um, some parents take time to take pictures of their kids doing the chore. Some of you might be groaning and saying, good grief, that's ridiculous. Um, but essentially it's whatever works for you. Uh, younger kids, it could be pictures. Older kids, um, like me, when I, you know, four kids in the house, basically we would write the name of the child. Here's what they need to do. And then what is their chore? so that they know what they were doing. And even though we allow kids to have some control by choosing what their chore is, we also would alternate those chores um, because we wanted them to be familiarized with how to do all things, not just the things that they like to do, even though we learned that some were especially good at mopping floors, others were really good at cleaning off countertops, Basically, giving them a week to do that thing, and then switching up the chores seemed to work pretty well for us. Um, 
I'm going to give an opportunity for people to chime in. Oh my goodness, our time is just, <laughs> time is going fast here. And so um, there might be other things that you're doing uh, to divvy up how you do chores. And there's certainly no one way of doing that. It's really whatever works to your, you know, for your particular family. So as we start to wrap up, I'm starting to look and pay more attention to the time. Here's some things that that it's important to plan for. And this is a, another poll. Uh, if you would take a minute to think about if your kids are not already doing chores or just knowing your kids, how will they respond um, to taking on some additional responsibilities around the house? Rachel's gonna post our next poll. And if you could just take a minute to go ahead and click on all that apply to you when you consider your individual kids. I have posted it. Are you seeing it? I am not. Okay, looks like no one's responding, so they may not be seeing it. Let me try relaunching it. Oh, here we go. Okay. How do you expect your kids to respond? So for everybody, go ahead and take a minute to do that. Uh -oh. So I am now creating a tremendous amount of problems here. Okay, so folks, if you just bear with me, I'm gonna get us to the slide that we need to be at. I apologize for my learning curve here. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna take just a guess here and assume that the kids that are yay, chores I'm in might be younger. That could be an assumption on my part. Uh, it looks like most of our kids are gonna probably argue a little bit about that. And some of us are gonna test with the test. You know, they're gonna be defiant here, which, you know, essentially, that is their job is to test. So let's talk about, um, you know, what to do as we encounter some resistance, all right? Um, it, plan for it, okay? Uh, if you decide that you want to incorporate this idea of having your kids do more around the house, get into the habit of doing that, um, if this is something that they haven't been doing, it's important to stop and talk about it, have a conversation. Um, you know, just say, you, you might say, for example, um, now that we're having more time together as a family, I'm realizing that it would be helpful for you to learn how to do different things around the house, because ultimately you want to have your own house someday. And so, you know, moving forward, here's what we're going to do. All right, so having that conversation. Then uh, the second piece is sharing control with your children as much as possible. And so, <coughs> excuse me, we talked earlier about creating a list of things that need to be done and we need to be you know, mindful of the age of our kids. And so with kids who are resistant, who are like, I don't wanna do any of these things, and that's how my kids uh, were, uh, especially the older one when I introduced this in my own home. I said, okay, Allison, pick two things that you hate the least, right? You might not like any of these things, but pick two that you hate the least. And so letting them decide how they're gonna contribute, but then also setting up some parameters for Let's have these done. Would it be better for you to do these things first thing in the morning or would you rather do them before lunch? You decide. And so that's an ex another example of how we share control. Now for any of you who have kids that might push this a little bit, um, <coughs> our kids job is to test us. All right. Look at your kid as a scientist. A scientist's job is to test different hypotheses to see whether or not they're going to work. 
And so it's very natural for when you set a limit or an expectation with your kids uh, for them to test you to make sure that you're, are you serious? All right. And so for example, if you have had this conversation, your kid has agreed to do certain chores and they're gonna be done by lunchtime and you see your kid getting on doing computer games or something else yet the chores are not done. Instead of getting angry and starting to lecture them, we would go over to them and say, oh man, here's our empathy folks. This is a bummer. I would really love for you to take some time out to play your game as soon as you've taken out the trash and unloaded the refrigerator. Now, what is your kid gonna say in response to that? Most of them are gonna try to argue with you. And so we know when our kids argue about a responsibility or a limit that we've set, that it's best to state that limit one time, turn off your brain, because if you leave your brain on, words are gonna come out of your mouth. You might say things like, for crying out loud, can't you see the stress on this family? We're working from home. Do you see all of the things that we are already doing for you? And when we get into that lecture mode, our kids are kind of like wah, wah, wah. So instead, we're just going to turn off our brain and say, I love you too much to argue. You're welcome to fill in the blank. So whatever it is that the kid wants to do as soon as, and you can fill in the blank there. All right. We don't want to get caught up into arguments because we know from experience that our kids are never going to stop and say, you know, you're right. I really do need to step it up a little bit and contribute a little bit more. You're working so hard. Why don't you go put your feet up? That's not going to happen. All right. So we're not going to get hooked into those arguments. And then finally, if needed, we're going to allow empathy and logical consequences to do the teaching. And this really applies to our kids who um, are more defiant about doing chores. And I apologize. Here we go. Um, so what do you do if you have a kid who says, I'm not going to do that. You can't make me. And I, I, I know that, you know, we deal with those situations as parents. And, and one of the things that I think it's important to know is that, you know, as a parent, we can do all the right things to position our kids to be successful and still have kids that make poor choices. And we might look at a situation where a kid really doesn't have a lot of great family supports, but yet they're doing great. And there's no rhyme or reason, really. And so the important thing when you're dealing with a defiant kid is number one, to take good care of yourself. And so we need to come up with some type of plan in advance. So we always think about how might my kid respond to this. We want to protect ourselves and take good care of ourselves by not nagging or reminding our kids, hey, it's three o'clock, you know, come on, you need to get busy, let's go. And we need to think about, okay, well, what could a logical, uh, excuse me, a logical consequence be? And I'm going to share a story with you um, as we wrap up this part and we'll jump into some questions. Um, for kids, as you know, my third daughter, Katie, who is now um, 20 years old, we refer to Katie as someone who lives on Katie time, meaning she is totally in her own world. Total type B personality, not a whole great deal of stress going on there. That's actually a positive thing. But where it became a problem is when the family started to notice that we were always waiting on Katie to do things. Uh, we're getting ready to go. Everyone's in the car, but who's missing? You guessed it, it's Katie. And as we were incorporating contributions into our home, on a particular uh, Sunday, we talked about the kids about what their responsibilities were gonna be. And we said to them, everyone who is done by noon will get to do something with the family. 
And so we're going to reward them with our time rather than reward them with things. And so lo and behold, um, <coughs> excuse me, Jennifer and Allison, Sammy was not even born yet, got their stuff done right away. And it was very tempting to not remind Katie and say, hey, you know, you're going to miss out. If you don't jump in and get this done, you're going to really regret it. But one of the things that we know is that the path to learning is, is brought through making choices and living with the natural consequences of those choices. And so at noon, sure enough, Katie still had not done anything. Everyone else had done their stuff. And as I was checking in, Katie panicked and started running to try to get things done. And using love and logic, we respond first with empathy. Oh, man. You know, and then the logical consequence. It looks like you're not finished. And so you're not going to be able to join the family on our outing today. Now, this worked out because this happened during March Madness, which is my husband's favorite basketball time of the year. And so he was happy to stay back and be with Katie while I took Allison and Jennifer to go to a park and have some fun. Now, what was difficult about this was that as I'm driving out of the cul-de-sac with my older two daughters, my youngest daughter is running after the van crying. And I'm thinking on some level, oh, dear Lord, what are the neighbors going to think? But the reality is it's none of their business. I'm teaching my daughter a very important logical consequence about contributions. And so... Next week, when we went through the same cycle again, the good news was that Katie was the first one done. And oftentimes that's how kids learn, is by experiencing the logical consequences, whether they're good or bad, uh, that go along with the decisions that they make. Now I realize, again, I appreciate your grace because this is our first webinar, but if there are some questions that you would like to ask, uh, what we could do is take maybe five, 10 minutes to go ahead and answer those. And so if you would like clarification on anything that we've talked about so far, now would be a good time to go ahead and put that in your chat. Or if you want to, you could maybe we could unmute you and you could just ask your question. Yeah, I think if, uh, if anyone has a question, go ahead and raise your hand and then I can and a note who has a question and select an individual to go each at a time. But also feel free to use that chat box as well. So Rebecca is asking, um, what is your opinion about keeping the room clean versus just doing chores for a reward? Okay, um, well, so let's, let's correlate that with um, a short term. How old is, the, is your child? 12. Okay, so a 12 year old. Um, okay, so one of the things that can be helpful in getting things going is to have some type of reward mechanism you know, as they're learning a new habit, and we know that it takes about 21 days to learn a new habit, all right? But the problem is, is that if we use those rewards, uh, typically the parent is doing more of the energy and monitoring that, whereas we want the kid to be doing, putting their energy into that. The other problem is that we want our kids to understand that they're participating in contributions because they're a part of a family, all right? Oftentimes parents will ask, you know, as we think about rewards, should we pay kids for doing chores? Um, the love and logic philosophy on that is that kids participate in chores because they're a part of the family, not because they're getting a dollar or two dollars or five bucks, right? However, where those two things can cross is when we have a child that does things that we would normally do, but maybe we don't have time to do, 
or the kid is looking for additional ways to earn some money. And so I had a, a, kid, a family in class whose son was really good at mechanical things. And he said, I'll, I'll, I need some money. Um, how about if I change the oil so that you don't have to go to the Jiffy Lube? And dad said, huh, you know, that, that could work. Why don't you call up the Jiffy Lube and ask him how much an oil change is? And so once he had that information, he then said, all right, I'm going to pay you a little bit less than that because Jiffy Lube, they're the experts, but uh, you will get reimbursed for helping out with this chore that we would normally have to hire out or, or basically do ourselves. All right. If we're going to reward kids, which I, I do think that's a positive thing to acknowledge and praise and, you know, just notice what they're doing. Um, uh, acknowledge them with your time. You know, let them decide what is it that you would like to do? What could we do together? Um, those are great ways to support and acknowledge their contributions. We have another question. How do we know if we are taking too much away as a logical consequence, such as no video games or electronics for in um, a, a kid who's age nine to 11. Okay, so a nine to 11 year old, um, you know, their natural thing is gonna want to be to do things that they love to do, you know, that bring, bring pleasure, that bring joy. You know, anyone is not gonna necessarily want to do chores. And so the idea is that we don't wanna take these things away from you. You know, you're welcome to do these things for, for an agreed upon period of time as soon as you've completed whatever this uh, contribution is. And so it's really, the kid has control over the situation. Um, we're saying you're welcome to have 30 minutes to play your game as soon as you have this finished. And this is then where the kid starts arguing, this is the situation where you're gonna turn off your brain and say, hey, I love you too much to argue. And you may need to remove yourself from the situation and get involved in something else because part of when we do that is we avoid that confrontation, especially if you have a, a strong-willed kid. Uh, but the other piece is that as you walk away, um, you're kind of showing them that you think they're gonna comply. They're gonna make a good choice. Okay, and we had a question come in before um, today's session. Okay, seventeen-year-old son is unmotivated. When he was uh, when he was able to go to school, he was doing really well. He complains about being bored. Everything I say is met with disgust. How do I motivate him? Okay, so that's a hard one. Um, so seventeen-year-old. So we're almost an adult. We're almost ready to you know head out into the real world. I, I think the first thing that we need to start with is empathy. Um, you know, having been, most kids of that age are very social and they want to be at school with their friends. A lot of kids are still working on developing organizational skills. And so their ability to self-motivate and create a schedule and get things done is something that's still emerging. Um, and if we look at, you know, love and logic, the idea is how do we make it the kid's problem and not the parent's problem? Because oftentimes we're trying to motivate from the outside in rather than finding ways to motivate from the inside out. Uh, the only person whom we can truly control is ourselves. And as kids get older, they need to start making those decisions and coming up with a plan that works for them, all right? And so where I would start personally, um, you know, as a therapist is just acknowledging that this is really hard, you know? The kid is probably grieving some losses, uh, you know, many losses, and this is quite an adjustment for everyone. But then I would send, you know, the can-do message, you know? So what are you going to do? You know, there's still, even though this is a situation that no one asked for, um, it's a huge interruption, we're not liking it. Um, what are you gonna do? You know, how, how are you going to 
be able to, what is your plan for getting things done and whatnot? Because ultimately I'm gonna love you uh, no matter how long, you know, this is, this takes, I know Jim Fay jokes about, I'm going to love you no matter how long it takes you to get through your junior year in high school. Uh, but I'm not a huge fan of that. But the point is that uh, they are responsible for their uh, outcome. You can't make them do things. Um, you can empathize with them. You can provide them with ideas. You can provide them with suggestions. And ultimately, it's up to them to start deciding what works for them and what doesn't work for them. All right. Another thing we know is that kids learn. We, we talked about logical consequences tonight, but we also know that our kids learn through watching us, through the example that we set. And so, you know, talking openly about what your plan is. You know, we know it's important to get up, you know, at the same time each day you know, take a shower, have some type of routine for your day and talk about that out loud um, so that your kids can also uh, model after you and see what you're doing, um, but also giving them some time to figure out what is the process that's going to work best for them. Uh, the social connection piece is critical. And so, you know, providing time for them to you know, be able to connect with others in a safe way. You know, they're, they probably are better experts at that than we are. Um, but those are some suggestions. Um, some things that you do need to watch for though, signs of depression. Uh, you know, where a kid starts really not taking care of themselves, hygiene starts to, um, they're not taking good care of themselves in that way. You know, in situations like that, where the kids just not get bed, change attitude, isolation, that's when it might be a good idea to reach out to uh, perhaps a mental health professional, because I know a lot of them are doing different things online now to assist with situations. So, if we have like another, <laughs> someone who wants to ask a question. Okay. Ladybug, is that, do you have a question? So you've unmuted yourself. Nope, she remuted herself. No more questions, okay. Okay, well, thank you folks. Um, so Rachel will be sending out a survey to you just to get your feedback on tonight. Um, so we would like to know what are the things that you would like to talk about. And I just wanna let you know that next Tuesday at this time, we're gonna be talking about keeping the peace. And so this is essentially an opportunity just to talk about resolving conflict. Um, you know, how, what kind of sibling rivalry issues are you dealing with um, and how can we assist with that? And so that's our next topic followed by uh, April 21st, I'm bored. You know, how can you empower your kids to resolve the I am board issue? And then Tuesday, April 28th is really up to you. You know, what do you want to talk about? What topic is important to you? Um, again, this is our first time doing this type of webinar. And so I really would like to get your feedback on how, to, how we can make it better, how we can make it more interactive. And so you will be getting an email with a survey on that. If you wouldn't mind taking a minute to complete that, that would be awesome. Um, Rachel, anything else you wanna add? Nope, I think that's all. Thanks, thanks to all for attending and we'll get that email out to you tomorrow. Okay, all right, thank you everyone. And if there's any more questions that you wanna ask. Is that a kid? Yeah, yeah, sorry. That was mine. I just wanted to say thank you. You are so welcome. <laughs> yeah, we, should, right. we should end every night with videos of kids. That's right. Everybody put their <laughs> kid us, in the screen. Show okay. us the kid who's making you crazy. All Thanks right. all. Yes. Thank you for joining.